Hello there, dear listener. I am delighted to announce that we're working with Second Run to celebrate the release of the new restoration of Maria Sarkin's The Lighthouse, aka Mayak, on Region Free Blu-ray. By visiting their website, secondrundvd.com, and using the coupon code RUSOFILES, that's R-U-S-S-O-P-H-I-L-E-S, at checkout, you can get 10% off the list price of The Lighthouse, and or any other Blu-ray or DVD on secondrundvd.com. That's secondrundvd.com. Their collection includes films by Vera Chetilova and Andrzej Zhuovsky, both of whom will be getting a mention on this episode of the show. Please be aware that the discount covers the Blu-rays and DVDs at secondrundvd.com only, and it does not apply to the delivery charge. The coupon code is good until the 28th of April 2022. You'll find the link and the rest of this information in the show notes for this episode. I would, of course, be delighted to find out what you've used the code for, so please find Roos Files Unite on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, or drop us a line at roosfilesunite at gmail.com. Happy browsing, and on with the show! This is the Rus Files Unite podcast, where we talk about Russian films and films with a Russian connection. As always, I'm joined by a guest, and today my guest is Daniel Bird. Hi, Daniel. Thank you very much for joining me. Hi, Ali. Uh, thanks for inviting me on to the podcast. So before we discuss the film that we're going to be watching, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Daniel? I'm a film historian, so I've programmed retrospectives of filmmakers. I've curated some exhibitions. I work with distributors as a consultant. I've made a few documentaries and written, edited some books with a Russian or former Soviet connection, let's say. And uh, occasionally I've worked with filmmakers on things like subtitles, editing scripts and developing projects. But the thing which I'm most keen on is film preservation and restoration. Right, right. So uh, tell me a bit about your um, involvement with film preservation then. So there's something I know that you've been uh, heavily involved in. Uh, you may even be the, the founder. It's something called the Hamo Beck Nazarov Project. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Right. Well, um, I think, well, I started writing about film and I was writing mostly about uh filmmakers from what was known as the eastern bloc uh specifically the czech new wave directors from the 60s and uh frequently banned polish directors most notably andrzej Zawski and valerian borovczyk who because they were banned all the time ended up um living and working in france so they were really polish emigres and uh, this was the mid to late 90s and this was before the internet uh, is what it is today so most of these articles and interviews were published in 
calling them fanzines is not really doing justice, give, uh, doing justice to, to these uh, these magazines because they were they were very professional looking, but they were still uh, print runs of only about three thousand copies and published very erratically. And uh, in order to kind of give the magazines a boost, I got involved in organizing screenings and to organize a screening. And again, this is before the digital revolution, so to speak. It meant finding 35 millimeter film prints and getting permission from the people who owned the rights, the legal rights to, to exploit the titles. So that got me interested in both film prints and um, rights, uh, the legality surrounding titles. And it also put me in touch with many distributors. And uh, there was one specific incident, and that was a retrospective of Valerian Barovchik films 20 years ago. It's terrifying to think of it like that. But, <laughs> yeah, um, don't think about that too hard. Yeah, uh, it's uh, 20 years ago at the Luck Center, which doesn't even exist anymore. Um, and I invited Borovchik and he agreed to come to London and it seemed too good to be true. And it was too good to be true because then he wrote, he sent a fax and he basically said, um, I don't want to stand in front of films I don't recognize because the films which you'll be projecting are just strips of celluloid with holes punched into them. They're not my films. And what he meant by that was that, uh, yeah, the film prints had deteriorated, they'd faded, they'd become scratched to the point where he didn't recognize them as the films which he was the author of. And that really planted the seed of um, making new copies. And at the time, this was still the analog era. So uh, I was looking at making well, raising money to kind of make new prints of the key films, particularly the short films and the early features. And, um, well, that didn't happen. And then Borovchik passed away in 2006. Um, but then finally, after many years of trying, uh, an opportunity presented itself to... Uh, to restore these early films and to uh, get them back in distribution with an English distributor called Arrow Films. And that happened about 10 years ago. It, it really kind of, the work, the, the pre preliminary groundwork was done about 10 years ago and uh, the, the agreements were about 2012 and then it actually came into being in 2014. And um, so always a problem when you actually have a successful problem uh, project that that defines you so suddenly you know I, i'm cast as <laughs> sort of restoration expert which i'm really not uh in that particular instance it was the head of restoration at arrow films james white who produced those restorations and should get credit for those restorations my job was basically liaising with the estate and coordinating the project and uh, mediating between the distributor and the, the the family and to ensure that there were restorations which everyone was happy with, but also that they were contextualized and marketed in a way in which everyone was happy with. And uh, that worked out rather well. Um, uh, that project, it won prizes in Bologna, which is the, the can of... The, kind of classic films and uh, the Focal International, which is this organization involving uh, the use of archival material in television and, and documentary film. And they gave it a prize for the best preservation and restoration project. And then a friend in uh, Yerevan, Armenia, basically said, well, let's, let's do the same, but for the, uh, the classics of Armenian cinema. And... Um, Initially, I said no, but but in all honesty, around. no. I mean, I, if if I'm really honest, uh, and, and and this is this is the honest answer. It, it's it's nice to work with people you like. It's nice to 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 visit places like Yerevan, uh, cities I like, and especially when they have such fantastic food and wine. <laughs> it's just really, you know, it's very, it's, it doesn't take much to persuade me to go to a trip to either Georgia or Armenia when you know that 
it's always going to be interesting. And that's, uh, that's half the battle, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, uh, so that, that, that was the, the, the foundation of this particular project. Uh, I had done various projects um, concerning Sergei Parajanov. Um, I first visited Yerevan in 2004. And the purpose of that visit, it was a working holiday. I was teaching English as a foreign language in hey, Warsaw. Hey, that, that, was, that was what I was doing in Moscow. That's how I ended up out there. So, it's, it's, I, I think it's a wonderful way to, uh, to, to live and work in a, mm. in a different place. And I, I certainly, um, I mean, I initially went out to, to Poland. Um, I applied for a scholarship um, and I spent a year in Warsaw. And then I extended it a year. Uh, and then when, when that scholarship had been exhausted, I couldn't quite bring myself to return. I'd gone feral. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I did a CELTA uh, course and, and taught English for a year. And, and, and during the summer break, yeah, I went to, to Yerevan, um, ostensibly to write a book. I, I published a book on Roman Polanski, um, that's not something you want to have in your CV these days, but well, uh, no, I, it's, I, I think that I think that I mean I, I am very firm about this. I, I, I reread the book for the first time in a very long time, and and I, I do actually agree with everything I wrote. I would have phrased things slightly differently, mm. but I, I do think that the I, I certainly haven't changed, and uh, and I and I've rewatched the films and. Um, I don't think this is the time and place to to revisit that particular debate. Well, but sure. I, I do, I do <laughs> yes. feel I do feel that I think I, I that we will look back at this particular moment in history the way we look back at say the second half of the 1930s in Soviet Russia in the way that uh, people aren't necessarily expressing themselves in a particularly direct manner, uh, <laughs> and uh, and I think that maybe Polanski's films. Uh, will be reevaluated, particularly the last one uh, about the Dreyfus affair, which I think uh, it's really unfortunate and um, spineless, quite frankly, on behalf of distributors and cinemas that that hasn't been officially screened in the UK. But um, so anyway, Polanski was the first book, and for the second book, I wanted to write about Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, the film Parajanov made in. Uh, Ukraine or the Hutsul Chisna um, region of Western Ukraine. And um, that was simply because it was close to Poland. And my mm. girlfriend at the time was a Ukrainian philologist and singer, and she'd spent a lot of time working and recording with musicians in Hutsul Chisna. So I envisaged a sort of working holiday of, uh, yeah, um, going there and uh, getting the. Uh, first-hand info on this Parajanov film because many of the people involved in that production were still alive at that point. Mm. And the editor of the book series um, said, well, if we're going to feature a Parajanov film in this series, it has to be the colour of pomegranates. And then I thought, shit, well, you know, this is a bit too alien for me. I love the film, but I don't know anything about uh, this at all. And then I thought, well... Well, fuck it. I'll just go to. I'll just go to Armenia. Just go to Yerevan, as you do. And wing it. And wing it. And 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 that's what I did. I I met a uh, a filmmaker called Don Askarian, who was an Armenian filmmaker who split his time between Yerevan and Berlin. And I met him at a festival in Slovakia, Trenčan Teplice. I don't think the festival exists anymore, but he had a small retrospective. And uh, and he offered to be a, a fixer, essentially. So if I were to visit Yerevan, he would help to connect me with various people. And uh, so I travelled to Yerevan, and 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 I met Don and and his his wife at the time, uh, uh, Nune Hovanesian, who is the daughter of a um, filmmaker called Bagrat Hovanesian who um, died very young and made some quite remarkable Armenian films, which uh, I really do feel uh, should be 
watched and rediscovered and reappreciated, certainly outside of Armenia, they're really quite remarkable. Uh, but in in the West, Bagrat is probably most famous for playing the king at the end of Andrei Rublev, and he's one of the scientists which you see in Solaris in the black and white debriefing section. So he was very close to Tarkovsky, and he was a sort of literary editor on The Colour of Pomegranates. So between Don and Nuno, they, they sort of connected me with various people and helped me when I went to hey, uh, High Film, the, 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 the Armand film, the former Soviet studio, which was just um, falling apart at that particular point in 2004. Yes, and, yeah. Uh, so on, that a, was, uh, on another podcast, you described it as resembling an Alexei German film. <laughs> well, it, 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 well, I mean, it, it really, uh, it had been built in the 1970s. Uh, obviously, all the resources at that point were concentrated in the, 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 the flagship studios, which were Moss Film and Lem Film. But in the 1970s, it, it was a modern studio uh, by, by Soviet standards. And um, yeah, but by the time I visited, which was 2004, it, it was very, very strange. With no electricity, this kind of carpet threadbare and the smell of cigarette smoke and all the signage and language was in Russian and, and, and then no film. So it was just like it was like a ghost, a ghost house, because you have all these memories of this cinema from about from, from 100 years from now. So going back to the 1920s, but no real films in production and uh you know the the laboratory was on the brink of collapse so it was very fascinating on one level but really quite um melancholic on the other and uh so that 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 planned book i came back with lots and lots of interviews and i met like uh, Yori Sayadian, who was the, the sound engineer on The Colour of Pomegranates, and Stefan Andranikan, who was the production designer, Levon Abrahamian, who's since become a, a good friend, who was a cultural and who is a cultural anthropologist, but he, he was a student at the time and he 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 was cast. Uh, he has a small role in the colour of pomegranates. And uh it's the first time I met uh, Zavan Sogassian, who was the director of the Parajanov Museum, who, who passed away from COVID um, about a year ago, unfortunately. Oh, um, but uh, so, yeah, I, I really, it was a, a very a horrifically expensive meeting, uh, uh, sorry, not meeting, a visit, at which point I remember thinking, God, I have to do something with these interviews in order to justify this huge expense. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, and so I'd love to say it was passion and, 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 you know, some sort of, but no, it was like, how do I dig myself out of this financial hole? <laughs> and and I, I, I never did. It just got deeper. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that I got back and the, the book series decided not to continue. Uh, but that coincided with a colleague at the BFI who decided to do a Parajan of retrospective. So I, that research put me in a good position to write a report for the BFI on the rights and materials. So who owned what and where the materials uh, in which archives, because... So and who you might really, need to talk to? Well, th this is what really, really fascinated me because um, uh, I've been um, watching over the years and... Without question, I do like watching them, these Mark Cousins documentaries on, on cinema. Uh, and his basic message is films are not about box office, they're about marketing, they're about passion and ideas. And that's great, uh, but, but the reality is they are about um, money and, uh, and studios and objects. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Hollywood studio or, or, a, or a studio in a communist state, that film has to be paid for. That film has to be produced as a physical object and it has to be archived. And there has to be some sort of legal attribution as to who owns it, both during the communist period and in the post-Soviet period. And that issue really was brought into focus by that visit to Yerevan, but also preparing that report for the BFI. And that really... Uh, 
became the foundation for what this it sounds terribly grand the ammo back bazaar project but you know it's really an informal group it's a network of people like myself uh, scholars like james stefan uh, restoration specialists archives people with the shared interest in cinema and it is basically uh, there to address a uh, what i would describe as a post colonial problem whereby in the soviet period the key uh, feature films the negatives all went to gos kino the central committee of film matters right all roads lead to moscow exactly uh, and then the negatives all went to the national film archive gos filmo fund and then after the disintegration the the actual export rights the rights to the films reverted to the studios the regional studios which produced them but the negatives re- remained in uh, gos filmo fund and i don't want to suggest that's a bad thing because it's a very good archive and the films are safe there and the regional archives are they do they do what they can with the the resources they have available and and some are excellent and some uh, are really kind of hamstrung by the lack of resources right it's not for want of trying it's just as you were saying these things cost money and you know it's the the 90s and early 2000s weren't a good time to be like a post soviet well, uh, state not, not not even that i mean even recently in armenia i mean the restoration budget was a few thousand dollars which is just surrealistic so it was a case of okay how can we work with this um situation very pragmatically and uh so after that report there was a retrospective at the BFI uh, organized by uh, uh, Layla Alexander Garrett, who wrote the excellent book on working with Tarkovsky on the sacrifice. As, a, as, a, as an interpreter, and that was with uh, Lisa Tumushkina, who I, uh, I believe put you in touch with me. Indeed, yes, yeah. A quick editor's note. If you're new to the show, you might be interested to know that we actually had Alyssa Tumushkina on as a guest a little while back for our episode on Vasily Pichul's Perestroika-era drama Little Vera. So you can find that on the feed. So now I've told you about that. Back to the conversation with Daniel Bird. And Margarita Osepian, who who was also the the co-organiser of that retrospective. And as part of that retrospective, they had a one-day symposium. So they had various people talking about aspects of Parajanov's films. And I used that as an opportunity to talk about the situation of all of these elements and rights spread across Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, uh, Russia, of course. And uh, the problems in the post-Soviet era, namely, there was a fire in, in the Georgian archive at the time, which destroyed a lot of the sound elements. And of course, this has political resonance because these films were Georgian language, but they were distributed certainly at that time on DVD with a, a Russian voiceover. So that was, you could say that that was a pragmatic choice because the Russian elements were all that was available in Moscow. Uh, but at the same time, there is this lingering kind of colonial aspect of, well, you know, uh, and, and that really is drawn into focus when you have the conflict between Russia and Georgia from, what, 2008? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it becomes politicized in a really interesting way. And you could double that with Ukraine, the conflicts between of course. Uh, Russia and Ukraine. And then you could even, I mean, it's certainly something which I think is uh, frankly appalling how little attention the uh, Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict got last year, uh, oh my certainly goodness, in English yeah. press. I, I knew about it because, you know, I'm interested in that part of the world. But like, if you hadn't been looking for it, like, if I were to mention to it, it to 
basically anyone in the UK to just, and said, did you hear about this happening last year? The chances are they would have been like, you what now? Because it's just out of the way enough that it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, really. Well, the, the, there's that aspect, but I think also when you look at this um, this whole situation, it's trying to move away from this idea that this is somehow um, regional because, I mean, you could, on the one hand, speculate. I mean, you can. We, you can't isolate Azerbaijan, especially given the oil situation and the way that you can't isolate Kazakhstan, given the oil situation. At the same time, one year after I visited those studios in in Armenia, they were bought by a very rich member of the Armenian diaspora, and the idea was that with his money he was going to uh, privatize and redevelop Arman Film, and uh, and that didn't happen. It was owned for 10 years, and then it was renationalized again in 2015. I think there's there's one story which is assumed mythical status. When I arrived by Mashrotka at the studio, uh, the first thing you noticed outside of the foyer was a huge relief of uh, the David uh, Sassoon, the, the kind of from Armenian legend riding the horse wielding a sword and at some point over the next 10 years that that had collapsed and fallen off the studio and the amount of people who had spoken to in Yerevan who said that was like some sort of that was the spirit of the studio you know reacting at the crime at what had befallen it in that 10 years you know, oh wow uh, to go for it and 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 so now, of course, it's been renationalized, and 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 colleagues at the, at the cinema center of Armenia are basically trying to um, uh, salvage the films and what whatever's left from that. So I think that on the one hand, it, it's very emotive uh, the, this particular predicament. At the same time, I do think it's fascinating, given the fact that this is a studio. Uh, implemented within a Soviet system, within a socialist system, uh, and then watching what happens to those state entities during this period of privatization and uh, how those state bodies get reabsorbed and and gutted, as was the case with the studio. Uh, Because I think it really says a lot about how capitalism works. And and I think uh, rather than just pretending that everything will be fine if we adopt these these socialist ideas in the future. The best thing to do is to look, to approach the situation not as a pilot of socialism, but as an aircraft crash investigator, <laughs> to look at the wreckage. Uh, and that's really what I, I think it, that's, how, that's how I saw my job of looking at this wreckage, the, these ruins of studios, these ruins of cinemas, uh, and these, these, these films. So it was a case of piecing them together, but not limiting yourself to a particular country. Because, of course, in the case of Parajanov, this is an ethnic Armenian born in Tbilisi, Georgia, who was educated at uh, Vigik in Moscow and who was employed primarily by Dovzhenko Studio in Ukraine. Uh, so, yeah, you can't reduce a filmmaker like Parajanov to an individual country in the way that mm. you can't call... Shepetka, Ukrainian. You know, I mean, you can, but but you know, is she really Ukrainian? I mean, the, the, the ascent. You know, which of course it's based on a Belarusian author, produced by Moss Film. It's this. I think is typical. These are not atypical examples. This is typical of the Soviet system. So I think that it is really fascinating when I was traveling to these countries to see people scrambling through this wreckage to reconstruct a sense of national identity. And the way that, like Mubi, for example, did a season on classics of Georgian cinema. And of course, they were using Parajanov as an example of Georgian cinema. And although he made two major films for Georgian film, cinema, and he grew up in Tbilisi, He's ethnically Armenian, and the last film, Ashik Karib, was shot mostly in Azerbaijan. Yeah. So, you know, it's not simple. Uh, no. And of course, if you go to Russia, they'll say, well, he was a Soviet director, so it's really part of Russian heritage. So he counts as Russian, which, yeah. Yeah, which is so that, that's also not really helpful. So I think that if, if you, being, being from England and, and being from, 
from Stoke on Trent, which I guess is 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 you know you you could you could play you could be Switzerland you could you could you <laughs> could uh, not have any kind of particular allegiance to to uh, any one country, and uh, you could attempt to um, find a way to address these problems of material of film, the rights of film, and. Um, not reconstruct the Soviet Union, but nevertheless be respectful <laughs> to, to to the uh, the the range of backgrounds the people who made these films had. Right, and acknowledge those and say, yeah, that it's more complicated than just a big label saying Soviet or a simple la- label saying, oh well, this guy was born in Georgia, so Georgian. You know, well. Th- to be fair, I mean, when 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 I first saw these films, they were all distributed by um, they were the the way films from the Soviet Union were licensed and distributed to the West was through Soviet export film, and they would usually deal with um, specific distributors with certain sympathies in the West, like contemporary films in London or Archeon or Cosmos films in, 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 in Paris. And um, so they, they were kind of presented as uh, Soviet films. And I mean, that's certainly when I first saw The Color of Pomegranates. It was, yeah, I mean, they were all distributed by Soviet export film and they were essentially Russian films to all intents and purposes. The original, uh, the the Yutkevich version, because of course the film was recut by Sergei Yutkevich, it has Russian title cards. So you know, it, 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 they seem Russian. It's it's just um, more complicated than that. There's a there's a domestic cut of the color of pomegranates, which is a different edit with Armenian title cards. Uh, at the same time, that film was not shot exclusively in Armenia. It was shot in Georgia as well. There's even scenes in Azerbaijan, and it was edited originally in Kiev with the Ukrainian editor. So I think that really it, it one has to be um, impartial and uh, pluralistic when um, addressing this particular issue and be wary of um, having these particular films and filmmakers being swept up in nationalist rhetoric, which is as much a problem in former Soviet countries, as it is in England or France. So right, that, right. that really was my um, goal with this particular project. And to date, uh, uh, yeah, we, we just as a test case, uh, we, we took three films by Parajanov, Hakop of Natalian, which was a documentary made in Armenia based on an Armenian painter who worked primarily in Tbilisi, Georgia, at the end of the Russian Empire. And uh, Kiev Frescoes, which was a film uh, which Parajanov uh, started to make in uh, Kiev for Dovzhenko Studio and got as far as making camera tests, but then the project was shut down. And then a uh, cinematographer on the film, uh, um, Antipanka, Alexander Antipanka, and Antipanka, Antipanka, edited those camera tests into a short film. And uh, and then um, a documentary on uh, um, Perusmani, the Georgian kind of knife painter, uh, which he made in 1985 after Legend of Surami Fortress. So there were like these three films which have certain similarities in their terms of their engagement with art and the fact that you can see Parajanov's style developing in an interesting fashion. But yeah, one's Armenian, one's Ukrainian, and one's Georgian. So the idea of actually presenting them all together as a triptych, which sounds terribly grandiose, but <laughs> yeah, the, the but it, it nevertheless referred to the fact that Parajanov developed his aesthetic from fine art references, and I think uh, yeah, it it is um, rather than me talking about this. Uh, incoherently as I am now it's a good simple way in 45 minutes of showing look this is the same filmmaker who had this complex background and who shot films in these three different Soviet states and there is a a a coherency a homogenous quality and that's nothing to do with uh, the Soviet regime it's to do with the fact that uh, his aesthetic personality draws on and transcends these three 
cultural backgrounds. And uh, and I and, and I think it's that it's been a great pleasure to to work with colleagues in Yerevan and Kiev and in Georgia and and to compare and contrast with how they're all addressing their heritage and 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 finding a way and bringing these people together at kind of like film markets like in Berlin or Cannes to find ways of possibly collaborating on projects in the future and. Um, and then, yeah, presenting them as a triptych. Uh, at first at Rotterdam Festival a few years ago. Then we did it um, video on demand film at Lincoln Center last year, primarily because of the pandemic. And and recently, we've transferred these digital restorations back to 35 millimeter film. So we have 35 millimeter archival copies for the Pompidou Center in Paris and the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and also the three host studios. So uh, Armand Film, uh, Dovzhenko Studio, and Georgian Film. That, that was really um, quite an adventure and not the simple exercise I thought it was. <laughs> we also did something with, with outtakes. We did a, what started as an exhibition, and it turned into an installation of outtakes from The Color of Pomegranates, and that primarily was because the outtakes, I think, and it's ironic because I was talking about them at the British Film Institute back at 2010 as part of that presentation. Um, but I think the, the main interest is the way it's very unusual to actually have outtakes from a, a film in the Soviet period because they, they, they tended to incinerate them and, okay. uh, and recycle, recycle the elements. So in this particular instance, and it's a testament to the, to the staff at Armour Film, they salvaged these outtakes. And um, so at great length, having discussed with um, the director of the archives at the time, the Minister of Culture, we started to scan these negative outtakes in Warsaw. And we've done about 70% of them. There's still another 20, 30% left uh, to be to be shipped, um, so that's almost done. But from that material, we we made an installation at Rotterdam as part of the Art Directions program. And um, I don't, I mean, the reason the reason it's an installation as opposed to an exhibition is because um, not because not because we're all frustrated conceptual artists. It, it's more <laughs> to do with the fact that. Um, it's not just about the content, it's about the presentation. Okay. And it was important for us to, to present them not uh, in a particular way, which was on uh, 24 monitors, uh, which were flat. So you're looking down at them, uh, much like Armenian manuscripts. And, um, and on top of that, the space in which they were presented was very important. In Rotterdam, it was in a, it was in a functioning church. And in, in Armenia, when we presented it, it was in the foyer of a Soviet cinema, which looks like a church because of the stained glass windows. Mm. And um, the interaction between the, the monitors, the tables in which they were presented, and the space around it, I think, was what was most interesting. And uh, to the credit of the National Cinema Centre of Armenia, they really held back on presenting that at, in any context uh, they really paid attention to uh, if we're going to do it again we have to find the right venue and there has to be some sort of dialogue between the outtakes and the venue so that was interesting oh yeah and i've i've seen the photos from from the rotterdam exhibition it's just it just looks incredible i don't think i've seen anything from the the exhibition in or the um, installation in in Yerevan, but just like an incredible idea and just like what an amazing way of, of presenting um, those bits of film. It just, it looked fantastic. I would have loved to have seen that in person. Well, uh, well ho hopefully um, I, I would love to think that it, 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 it tours a bit and, and, and maybe, uh, I mean, we're certainly, I'm certainly looking at other possible locations, but uh, the, uh, I think that it really, it, it just goes to show that I mean, at the end of the day, this is this. These are outtakes. This is mm. um, not part of a film. It could be 
construed as junk. And there could be a dialogue hypothetically whereby people think, why are we even archiving this? And uh, and I think it it is in the spirit of Parajanov because if you go to the Parajanov Museum in Yerevan, which is frankly worth a trip to Armenia in itself, uh, it, it's uh, there, there are all sorts of uh, collages which Parajanov made from rubbish when he was in a labor camp in Ukraine during the 1970s. And it, it's, it's a great example of, of finding poetry and poverty, which I think is, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of aesthetics in uh, former socialist countries in this region. You know, the, the poor theater of Jerzy Grotowski in Poland, for example, or the Polish poster school. It, it, these are aesthetics born out of poverty and necessity, and like use what you have to hand. Exactly, and I think the idea of actually making essentially an installation out of junk outtakes, <laughs> uh, and, and it was a strange uh, alchemical, alchemical exercise. Of uh, uh, of course, you, you have the great advantage whereby you're working with Parajanov's outtakes and Parajanov's outtakes are gold and whereas right, most right. people's aren't. Yeah, there's some people's trash and then there's Parajanov's. So so I'd really like to take credit for this, but the point is I, I think you, you'd have to go out of your way to 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 fuck this up in terms of, <laughs> you know, you really have to fight to find a way of presenting this material uh, so that it didn't impress people. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Yeah, thanks, Sergey. No, it's uh, so that so that 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 was um, that was a and then there was a strange development which brings us to the subject of my finally, and that is that when I was in Yerevan, um, when was it? Yeah, two thousand eighteen. I was in Yerevan for Golden Apricot Festival, and each year they have a, an evening at the Parajanov Museum, and when I was there. I met uh, Victoria Lupic, uh, the producer of Mayak, and uh, and she said that the negative of Mayak, which is only from 2006, was missing, and uh, there were only two positive release prints, one of which was in Goss Filmer Fund and one of which belonged to the producer, and at which point, because there wasn't a high-definition version, a high-definition master of, of Mayak, I just said, whatever you do, if you can contrive a way of getting to Warsaw and just put the print as hand luggage, you know, I'll meet you at the airport and oh my we'll goodness. go straight to uh, the, you know, the the cleaning and scanning facility and, and we'll we'll just do it for posterity and then worry about what happens next later. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Victoria uh, had, had a trip to the US and she decided to get the visa uh, in in in, um, in Warsaw, and so she took the print in hand luggage, and yeah, I, mean, I met her in the morning, and then we took a taxi straight away, and yeah, we started the process of cleaning and scanning the print, and then um, uh, Kino Classica, which of course you know very well, um, they they did a, an evening of fundraising, and they raised, I think it was about two and a half thousand um, pounds. Which really, it was a case of okay, what what can we do for that amount of money? And uh, we we were able to do quite a lot. We were able to get the film ready to present in Rotterdam on the one year anniversary after Maria passed away, which uh, was uh, very poignant. Uh, yeah, but I'm very glad imagine. we made it. And Victoria was there to present the film, and uh, and it really kind of. I, I, I would say uh, highlighted the third problem, uh, and the, if the first problem is this this kind of complexity in terms of all these countries, and the second problem is, is the, the, the general poverty and and the, the the falling apart of archives and cinemas, and the third problem is is that things aren't peachy after the the fall of communism. Uh, the idea that if you process a film on thirty five millimeter. The laboratory has to store it. And if you don't pay the rental fees, that negative will get junked. If the laboratory goes bankrupt, you have to be very quick to get the negative out or the yeah, materials otherwise out. otherwise it's just or they get junked. going in the dumpster, yeah. So, so uh, 
so basically, uh, yeah, and, and it was really difficult. I remember Kino Classica saying it was really difficult to approach people about restoring a film from 2006, which I totally understand because you can think, yeah, it makes sense for a film made from the 1920s. That makes sense. Yeah, it's got some miles on the clock. Yeah. But a film from 2006, so, someone's, someone's taken the yeah, piss Yeah, how here. bad could it be in, in, in that many years? It's like, well, it's a long story. Well, well, it's, I mean, the irony is, is that whatever you, whatever you, whatever you may think about the, the communist system and the socialist countries, the negatives, even if the films were banned or repressed or on mm. the shelf, they tended to be safe. Uh, generally, they tended to be safe. They were all in Gossip and Mofondo or somewhere. Uh, but I think that it's been really shocking the, 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 the carnage, let's say, of the post Soviet period. Mayak is one example. Crostelli of My Car is another. The last reel of the negative is absent without leave. It's not in Gossip and Mofondo. Well, it's not in Paris. And, uh, and it's, it's terrifying. I mean, that's, that's certainly one of my favorite films from the last 20, 25 years. And, um, it, yeah, it was, uh, quite a shock to find out that that, that last reel was not where it was supposed to be. So, uh, and that, that, I think, yeah, if there was a way of educating people about how the fact that, you know, films aren't necessarily there in perpetuity, the fact you do have to look after them, you have to look after them in the proper environment, the right temperature, the right humidity. And these things cost money. And uh, filmmakers like Maria Sakian and, and uh, aren't, aren't uh, uh, they don't have... They 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 did don't or didn't have villas in in Beverly Hills. It's it's a different world. So so it, it's if there's any if there are any steps towards actually um, bringing people around to these very concrete problems, then uh, it's worth doing. And the only thing I would like to to really finish, let's say, this project is if we can get a scanner in Yerevan. Uh, because they do have a lot of films there. They have some negatives. And um, if there was a situation whereby they could scan their films and be trained and restore and distribute, because um, there is the colonial aspect to me of, uh, you know, an English person going across and cherry picking mm, what right. I think is important. And, and I would like a situation where someone just goes, you know, fuck what I think. You know, just just restore everything yourself and and program and distribute what what is important. So so if so, it seems a much more constructive thing to actually yeah to um, uh, effectively help to set up an autonomous independent center for preservation and restoration. And um, I don't know if that's going to be possible, but it, it would be a nice step towards. Uh, um, making sure that that heritage is preserved because the problem is because of the digital revolution, um, because these films are on 35 millimeter, yes, you have some television, telecenied masters from the 80s, which are hopelessly out of date. But other than that, if you're a young filmmaker in Yerevan or outside of Yerevan anywhere, and you're trying to develop your own identity much like maria was uh with the beginning of her career how do you reflect on your cinematic heritage if you can't see the films if they're not available and if you can't the only references are films from abroad and quite frankly as somebody who's taught in higher education um the last thing we need is more filmmakers doing a riff on Scorsese or <laughs> right. Christopher Nolan. Yeah, no shade on either of those those guys, but I, exactly, exactly. You know, they, they've made invaluable contributions towards cinema. Scorsese, especially with the the cinema, the World Cinema Project, and and everything else, and, and Christopher Nolan for championing the importance of thirty five millimeter in terms of film. But if if, if if there is a young filmmaker in any part of the world uh, and their only uh, cinematic references in terms of the language of cinema and the subject matter 
is a few auteurs, the Marvel Universe. It's quite frankly, uh, how is this different from these um, crude stereotypes of socialist <laughs> realism in the 1930s uh, in terms of, you know, uh, and, and that's really what it is. I, I, I really do think that one of the interesting things about this particular moment in time is reading those reports and those documents and what people were trying to do with socialist realism in the 1930s and then looking at the situation we're in now and uh, especially with people like Mark Fisher talking about capitalist realism and uh, I, I do I do get that sense of dread every time I turn on a streaming service and find a, a wide variety of films in different genres strangely conforming in both ethos and form as to um, and where the hell does this come from? So I think the only way you can disrupt that and change that is by going deep into history, going deep into the archives. And I, I always say the same thing. It's like if you go to a film festival, like at the moment, I'm just catching up at the films in competition in, 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 in Cannes because uh, the, the, the most of the main slate is released in French cinemas uh, within the week or two weeks after the festival. So so basically, to see the main slate, you don't have to go to Cannes, you can just go to the cinema. So I'm doing that at the moment. And for me, that's like swimming in the sea. That is like swimming in the sea. But I think in terms of going into film history, I think you have to take a deep breath and dive down. You've got another dimension, uh, 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 the dimension of time. And uh, you've got all sorts of ruins, strange animals, jellyfish, sharks. And it's constantly changing this idea that history is in some way static. It's not static. I mean, this last two years, we've seen statues being pulled down. Uh, who's to say that some racists will be immortalized in a statue in place of the last racist which were pulled down. You know, I mean, history is dynamic. It's constantly changing. And uh, this idea that everything is set in stone in the past. It's like, no, you don't necessarily know what's out there. It's the past is the past is a vast country. Exactly. And, yeah. And needs so, mapping. So it's like, it's, it's like Mayak is, Mayak is a perfect example of that because uh, this is a film which came out and was well received but i think didn't have necessarily a major impact it it just it just didn't fit what people were looking for but i think last year given the fact that as a consequence of me too there's been a huge what, what what's the polite word a period of reflection upon uh, uh of who who should we be uh, supporting and watching? And so there is this kind of mass scramble to find women directors. It's positive discrimination. Just give me any women directors uh, to, to screen or to distribute. But I think in, in the case of Maya, that, that worked really well because, of course, people were focused on looking at uh, female Russian directors. And here you have a film which not only is directed by a woman, but it, it's, it is an exceptional piece of cinema, as it always was. And uh, I think that really, and it's really gave, with all that attention on my, I think that finally it, it was starting to find the audience, which it didn't have in its initial run. And that's nothing to do with uh, certainly my efforts or anyone else's. I think it just, it is a film which found its audience much later. And it's, it was helped. It was a, a catalyst, uh, the, the, this kind of uh, recalibration uh, of uh, what, what what we're looking for in terms of directors and especially gender, I mean, that was a catalyst. It wasn't the reason, it was the catalyst. I mean, it always was a great film, but I think it, it really, it, it blossomed, particularly last year. I mean, it's strange, the year, after the first year, 2019, it, there wasn't that much interest, I would say, but certainly last year, it really started to gain momentum. And that it was really, it's great. It, 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 it certainly makes you feel that it was worth all the effort. But but at the same time, what I think, going back to the beginning, what, what, what was disturbing is the fact that you have a film which it, it appeared 
on streaming on the Lincoln Center platform in June or July of last year. And this was just when they were having the skirmishes between Amir and, and, and Azerbaijan. And then you have the conflict later on in the year. And I was slightly disappointed that there wasn't more commentary trying to uh, not ground the film, but it was really mm. freaky timing. Here you have a film uh, which is written by a Georgian who's clearly alluding to the the the, the conflict in uh, uh, South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia in the late 80s, early 90s. And here you have an Armenian director making a Russian film, which is clearly taking this script by this Georgian and, and reframing it to, to, to allude, not, not to be explicit, but to, to the, uh, the Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh region conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan. At the same time, these were all conflicts which were the result of the disintegration of the Soviet Union mm. and which are still problems to this very day. And, and I think that I would have appreciated, and I'm still waiting for, more commentary on Mayak in how it um, squares these conflicts uh, with the drama it's telling, which is nothing to do about those conflicts. It's to do with somebody coming home. And I think it's to the credit of both the screenwriter and the director that they, they kept it rather vague and allegorical. So it's like a backdrop. At the same time, the, the backdrop is incredibly prescient. And I think the fact that, that so few people were commenting on the, 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 the timing, it, it just underlines how oblivious uh, the general population is towards international conflicts in the South Caucasus, which is a real um, pity. That was a very long answer. And I'm sorry for that, but... Uh, no, that is that is fine. Um, yeah, I mean this this film only came to my attention last year, and I watched it on Mubi, and I I was very conscious of you know I've got to fifty plus episodes, and hadn't covered very many films directed by women at all. So yeah, I was definitely somebody who was like, oh yeah, maybe I should be actively looking rather than just just you know just picking things like unconsciously as they uh, as they just come down the chute rather than you know having a bit more of a an active eye for like am i representing the the variety and the, the diversity of what's actually out there or am i just being lazy um so well i i don't i don't think that's the case because i mean Certainly, I, I can. If I, I've, I've reflected on this, and I remember very the first time I really sampled, uh, let's say, cinema from the east, it was primarily through television. Yes, there was a time when these films would appear on BBC Two and Channel Four, and uh, this was part of their distribution agreements. I saw all the Tarkovsky films on TV. Uh, I saw Solaris introduced by Alex Cox. I saw the Parajana films on TV. And also in the 90s, I didn't see them when they were, were broadcast, but I did see video cassettes of Kira Muratova's Aesthetic Syndrome. Oh, wow. Which is, I, I think it's still such a mind-bogglingly, insanely brilliant film. And, and then there were videos of Shepetka's The Ascent, and then there was Hitler's Daisies from the Czechoslovakia uh, and at the time. So I, I personally don't feel that, um, yeah, it, this was a conscious attempt to watch films by women directors as if it were a separate genre, because I never saw it as a separate genre. And this is something I'm having difficulty coming to terms with. Is, is it some sort of, you know, a genre in itself? I don't see Russian films as a genre. I mean, I don't go... You know what? I, I want to watch a Russian film tonight, as right, if it's something other than the language which finds it. So, so you know, it's like I, I just don't see, um, uh, you know, Nachawo, the, the Panfilo film, or, or is in some way connected intrinsically with I don't know, you know, Stalker or something. You know, the, the, these are like chalk and cheese, and 
Uh, and and the problem, I think, certainly in the West, in the way that I mean, I I I, I made a film, a little film about Vera Hitilova and Esther Krumbakova and Yaroslav Kuchira, the cinematographer, uh, about daisies, and and I met and I, I did retrospectives on Hitilova and Krumbakova, and I knew Hitilova a little bit, not not well, but you know, I did see her from time to time, especially when I was in Prague, and um, uh, she was fantastic, but she was also absolutely terrifying i mean really it was really she was um and one of the things which is interesting in the way that her work has been cherry picked to fit an idea of what uh a progressive female filmmaker should be like in the last couple of years whereas if you go onto the guardian and you look at an interview she gave uh from about 20 years ago for the guardian she is merciless. Uh, she basically says that she's her politics. She's against idiocy, and there is many. You know, idiocy transcends ge- uh, gender, and there are as many idiots on the feminists as there are on the anti-feminists. And and I, I can that 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 um, resonates with my own personal politics. Let's say, and 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 it's and I think that on a more let's say. Um, articulate response it's i think the main difference between uh, the the directors like shapitka Muratova, and hitilova is that they're you're coming from a culture in which you have people like alexandra kolontai in the 1920s who basically argue that the only way that women could be emancipated is with through through class uh, and social change and and if you don't put it in the framework of this you're just left with middle class liberal feminism and i think that 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 really needs to be taken into account uh because uh you know you can't you can't cherry pick all of these things you can't look at you you can't look at these films and 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 separate them from the social and economic structures which produce those films um i mean it's paradoxical the idea that you have a studio system like Odessa Film in Ukraine making these formally, these incredible Muratova films, which are so bold formally, tonally, and content-wise. That would never happen in the West. <laughs> so, so the question is, is, is trying to trying to understand this. I mean, people talking about, you know, Catherine Begelow got the, the Oscar for the, the Hurt Locker. And, and well... Look, Larissa Shapitka, look what she did with The Ascent. I mean, The Ascent is, you know, one of the best war films ever made. That's what, 1976. And, and, and it's, so you could reframe that film and say, look, this is, a, this is a female director taking on a traditionally male genre, but do we, is that really what it's about? And, and can it be reduced to that? I mean, I, I just, I'm reminded of a situation whereby, um, I asked Vera Hitzlova about a comment which Jean-Luc Godard made uh, in, in a film called Pravda. And um, uh, she hadn't seen the film, but she basically said that she considered Godard a peer and the fact that she would like to be considered, you know, uh, her films in the same competition as, as Godard. And, and she was against the idea of actually, yeah, the, 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 the woman director as, as, as a genre in itself, because that's another form of the ghetto. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so I think that, I think this is a reason for looking at the cinema uh, from countries in which, um, yeah, you have people from the 1920s like Kolontai and you have such incredible directors. I mean, Muratova is really, I, I can tell you the only reason Muratova is not better known is because of really banal reasons to do with the rights and the materials. Uh, Odessa Film Studio was privatized and the rights are complicated. And on top of that, when you do these cultural retrospectives, you do often need support from um, uh, embassies and cultural institutes and um, especially at the BFI. I mean, if you, if you have the support of an embassy uh, they, 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 it minimizes the risk of putting on a retrospective. And I think a lot of the reasons they haven't done a Muratova retrospective is because there hasn't been the financial support there uh, from you know, various Ukrainian embassies and things like that. Uh, and it's down to the, the fantastic close-up cinema 
and in, uh, in London, which has really done the focus on Muratova. As a programmer, you should fight tooth and nail to to resolve those legal, financial, and material issues to present a work because I can't think of anything more interesting to screen at the moment. And I still think uh, aesthetic syndrome. I mean, that that's the one I saw first, and I think that's. The, I mean, I think there are other films which. Uh, which, which are which are you know equally fantastic, but the aesthetic syndrome for me is it's certainly one of those um, bombshell films. Yeah, I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I, from everything I've heard, I've heard that it is it's an incredible film, also an incredibly tough watch, but just like a very out there and unique. Um, again, I haven't seen it so. <laughs> So my characterization of it is is going to be inadequate, but um, yeah, it's very much on the list. So, well, I, I look forward to hearing what you think of it when you do get a chance to see it. Okay, right. Uh, I, I will take that as a challenge. Right. So I think we should probably crack on and watch the film. So there is a thing that we say at this point in proceedings. We say a bit of Russian, and the word we say is "payekhali" because that is what. Yuri Gagarin said when he was launching into into space. So as we launch into the film, that's what we're going to say. So if we count down then, three, two, one. Payakali. And we're back. Daniel Bird and I have just watched Mayak, or The Lighthouse, directed by Maria Sarkin. And before we let you know what we thought of the film, we're just going to have a quick summary of the plot from Daniel. So if you haven't watched it yet, this is where we'll get into spoilers. So if you don't want that, pause the podcast, watch the film, and then you can proceed spoiler-free. So without further ado... Over to you, Daniel. What happens in this film? Well, Mayak is not, I would say, a plot-heavy film. It's more of a mood piece. But there is a story, and that concerns a young woman by the name of Lena who returns home to a remote region of Armenia, which is uh, in the in the middle of a conflict, and uh, she's there ostensibly to um, persuade her parents to leave. And that's the kind of the, the narrative thrust. And, uh, but it's really a pretext for somebody to uh, become reacquainted with the people and places uh, where she grew up and who brought her up. And that is mixed up with the conflict and as this film progresses the conflict becomes more and more prominent and at the beginning of the film we tend to hear it on the radio and it's more like a a, a backdrop a, a, a sound backdrop but gradually the conflict kind of spills over into this very personal drama of Lena. And that sort of builds to a crescendo. Um, but life goes on, and it's a very humanist film, I would say. And uh, it doesn't, and I think this is the film's real strength, is that it doesn't get bogged down in the intricacies of any particular war. 
And uh, although, of course, it, I don't think you can really discuss. I mean, if you have any the, the slightest familiarity with the history of the Caucasus, you can't help but think of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. In this case, the first war from the late 80s until the early 1990s. And ironically, the scriptwriter was Georgian and uh, from a particular region of Georgia, which was uh, involved in another conflict, which broke out around the same time, the very end of the Soviet Union in Abkhazia. So it's really interesting how that original story was adapted to another war. But in both cases, they, were, they, they served as a backdrop. And I think that although I'm going away from the synopsis here, and just to a comment, <laughs> I'm just saying it when it's fresh in my head, but it, it was really, um, uh, as I mentioned before, it was really kind of really uh, prescient, the timing of the film when it was re-released on video on demand, uh, or not, not right, re-released, right. released, uh, uh, when the second uh, conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan broke out. I mean, it was kind of uh, quite uh, eerie how that, that film emerged literally weeks before that actually happened. And now watching it again, this story of how war affects people's lives, it just reminded me very much of what's been in the news the last couple of weeks in Kabul and Afghanistan. And, and I think that's partly due to the fact that it sort of reigns in the details and focuses on the personal um, implications of a conflict it's all very abstract when you read about things on the news, but when you're confronted with scenes concerning old ladies protecting their houses, uh, un unwilling or unable to leave, and uh, even though they know it's probably going to result in the end of them, it's, uh, I think it, it really focuses this particular aspect of war, which we don't necessarily get in newspaper articles. Well, and indeed... In in terms of in terms of films, like I don't know whether one would categorize this as a war movie in the conventional sense, because you tend to think of a war movie being having protagonists who are combatants. But um, I mean, Liana picks up a gun at a couple of different points, but she's really not a combatant. So it's it's very drunk, drunk on one of those occasions, isn't she? Oh yes, that. Seeing it the second time, it wasn't quite so bad. But the but the first time, when I didn't know what was going to happen, my heart was in my mouth when she was stumbling around with the gun and when she fires and just nearly there's nearly a horrible accident, but it's but it's all fine. Um, That's Chekhov for you. There's a gun on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah, yeah, and she walks around with it slightly earlier in there, and it's kind of like, oh, what's going to happen with this? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's yeah, uh, like I say, well, very. Well, I sorry, think you that, go. Sorry, no, sorry. Uh, I think that I mean, it, it is an interesting question about genre because I think uh, um, there's, there's a really exceptional interview with the cinematographer. Uh, Maxim, um, uh, who and, and it's on movie, and you can you can find it if you uh, Google the lighthouse or Mayak uh, Maxim uh, Drozdov. Yes, I'll make sure I link to it on 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 Twitter. Well, I, I think cinematographers are really fascinating people to talk to about films, simply because they're effectively, I would say, they're like translators in the way that they're translating. Uh, thoughts and feelings into images and uh, it, it's when it's effective it all seems so effortless on screen as it does Mayak but I think from that interview you really get a sense of the level of detail and the level of thought and the dialogue between Maxim and Maria and the support from the producers um, but the reason I mentioned that interview is because he, he makes a point to say that they never thought of the Lighthouse as, as a war film, and it isn't really a war film. The war is a backdrop. I mean, it is, it's, the war is like a, a Greek chorus, let's say. Uh, it is com not so much commenting on the action, but as intruding on the action. But I would say as a genre, it, it's really it's, um, coming home as an adult to where you grew up type film. And there is a, 
genre of that, I guess. And, and that that's the particular story, I think, and um, about confronting not so much your childhood, but your past, your roots uh, in a very uh, literal sense. I mean, you, you're physically going back to where you where you're from and, and you're physically meeting your parents and, and, your, and, your, and your acquaintances and friends. Um, but of course, that's all, that's almost a, a, a pretext for self-confrontation, let's say. And I think that is very much the story of, of somebody who's moved away, who has a urban existence and, uh, I mean, it's such a, I wouldn't say it's a cliche, but it, it, it's, it's a standard trope in literature, the person who, you know, uh, uproots and um, defines themselves in a different place. Um, but at home, uh, Lena's got no illusion with these people, you know. They know who she is. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I think that, that that really comes through in many of these episodes and um, these vignettes, because it doesn't really, I, I mean, I went on, it's always, I think one of the most interesting things for me of the last, I would say, 10 years or so is things like not just movie, but letterboxed in the way that you having people who are quite serious about logging their impressions of films when they watch them online. And so it's not people necessarily presenting themselves as critics although you do have critics on there writing and logging their impressions of films but it a lot of people are using them as, as a kind of, as a kind of um a lot uh, you know a record of uh, you know what they watched and what they felt and kind and of I a film that, journal in exactly a way. exactly and, and i think it is really fascinating to get this uh, more democratic let's say uh, film writing and and I think one of the the um, I would say consistent not themes but criticisms of of my work is its um, lack of plot. Let's say lack of and it, that is the fact that it is more of a collection of uh, an underdeveloped dramatically a sort of a set of ideas that don't necessarily fully coalesce. And on the one hand, I can. I can agree with that to one extent, but I, I, I also see it a slightly different way in a way that um, they're, they're kind of, it's, it's kind of impulsively searching for certain episodes and, and, and not forcing dramatic links in according to, you know, some sort of systematic programmatic plot structure. And I, I do think it's a strength and uh, mm, yeah. it's very atmospheric. Yeah. It's, it's a mood piece for me. Oh, a- absolutely. And I've seen quite a few comparisons with Tarkovsky. I mean, partly the just the absolutely beautiful visuals. We mentioned the cinematographer already, and it's it's just it's just a stunning, stunning film to to look at. But I'd also yeah be inclined to say that Tarkovsky tends to foreground emotion and an atmosphere and mood rather than focusing on on plot like plot's kind of a, a a kind of an excuse to have the have the movie in some ways and and obviously that varies from from film to film of of his but definitely i can see why people are making um, making the comparison well, I, I think it really depends on the viewer because it's interesting. Again, um, uh, I think one of the things I've done in lockdown is definitely look at some of these videos on YouTube as a, as a form of procrastination uh, of people <laughs> essaying on what's wrong with cinema. And it is interesting. You're confronted effectively with two polar extremes, the impressionistic, poetic, perhaps pretentious on the one side, and the meat and potatoes, everything's got to have a plot. And, nuts uh, and bolts. Nuts yeah. and bolts is on, on the other. And, and there's, there's, there's not much in between. And, and, um, and, and I think that um, there, there is a middle ground um, in a way that, um, yeah, we all try and eat healthily, but we, we have to <laughs> kind of destroy the, uh, the, the nutrition now and again with, uh, 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 you know, something 
I don't know, a kebab of some kind. You know, it's just like yeah, or a sugar, sugary confection sugary or something confection. like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it, yeah. it's, it's yes. not one or the other, in my opinion. And I think that uh, in the case of the Tarkovsky comparison, the film, I mean, just watching it specifically for this conversation, the film which really jumped out, I think, is without question uh, Mirror. And uh, that particular film, which is another self-confrontation with childhood, it's a different structure and a different setup, but uh, it is a meditation. I mean, if you've read the, the collection of essays published inaccurately under the English title Sculpting in Time, there's that fantastic anecdote whereby Tarkovsky talks about going back to his childhood, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the dach and the forest and it not looking right. So he, he built uh, the set to reconstruction based on his memories. And uh, and I think that that uh, using cinema as a means of of capturing not what happened but how you remember it and the difference between the two is uh, what makes yeah the the highly subjective exactly what makes the film uh, cinematic in in a very pure sense. I mean, there have been lots of I would say uh, we, well, academic papers in the way that it is the mirror doesn't have a, an ABC plot structure, but it does have the form of a kind of uh, a stream of consciousness, uh, something akin to, uh, you know, a cinematic analog to, I don't know, James Joyce Ulysses. And of course, all of these are very highbrow references you, you throw out to show how well read you are. And, and you know, well, but, well but, of course, <laughs> well, of course. But at the same time, I think what, what, what interested Eisenstein so much about Joyce in the late twenties was this uh, attempt to capture the flow of thoughts, the thought processes, and uh, and then he set out very consciously to devise a cinematic equivalent to a film in a monologue. And I think it was only by the time you get to filmmakers like Parajana with The Colour of Pomegranates and uh, Tarkovsky when they're less theoretical and more intuitive, do you end up with these amazingly complex structures how you react to those structures really, uh, I think, defines, says more about you, the viewer, than it does the, the film itself. I mean, if you, you could see Mirror as something profoundly self-indulgent and chaotic and, and, and incoherent. And I think you could equally, I mean, Mayak is nowhere near as extreme, but I, but I think it, it, it's definitely in the same ballpark. Um, but it, it is also, I think, uniquely cinematic. I mean, the, the really interesting thing about, uh, I would say, that the, the the Russian approach to narrative, if you go back to the 1920s with the formalist critics and this idea of the Kino Roman, the idea of striving towards a, a literary form in which everything is about action and nothing else. And to the point where the action film, a film like Shapayev, effectively, or you know, or even Eisen, displaces the 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 literary equivalent of a, a, of an action genre, you know. But I think if you if you go beyond that and you end up with um, films and filmmakers who are trying to do something which you can't do in literature, and I think that's the the, the space where Tarkovsky uh, really defined himself, and I think that's definitely the space in which Maria wanted to. Um, occupy and develop and I think what for me personally and I've said it time and time again the, 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 the particular significance of Mayak for me is a filmmaker which on the one hand is acknowledging uh, a past tradition acknowledging a heritage of films and filmmakers but rather than doing an imitation or a pastiche uh, she's building upon it where can it go what can it do to comment about what's happening now? And I think in that particular instance, she makes a number, I would say, of um, explicit references, not so much, I would say, in the film, although you could say that the very, a number of Tarkovsky-like elements, the, all the, 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 the function of nature, landscape as a refrain, the particular choice of angles, these sort of, not so much crane shots, but looking down these these angled shots of looking down at the earth and of characters, and and the role of water in particular. I mean, and that's something it has in common with with uh, mirror 
the, the, there's a great scene with with uh, with Lena, uh, and she she puts her hand in a bowl, and and then the, the camera holds for quite a long time, and it settles oh, on a reflection. Oh, yeah, and you and you get this weird distortion of her her face, and it kind of shifts around. Yeah, that's it. It's very it's a very striking image, and you, I guess you can read it symbolically as it, it sort of. Uh, um embodying her her like um i was gonna reach for the word discombobulated state of mind but that's really not what i'm going for <laughs> but well, uh, uh, well, disturbed and... war is, is definitely discombobulating i think so, yeah. yeah to put it mildly yeah yeah i mean it is interesting how across the different episodes in some she's kind of taking it in her stride and others she completely goes to pieces i'm th- i'm thinking in terms of the the former when uh, xania is, i think it's i think i'm remembering this right yeah. is um who's the uh elder uh, i think is her aunt or an yes. el- elderly or yes. elderly lady in the in the in the village and she's very frightened by the bombing, understandably, but Lena is apparently holding it together, and maybe this is she feels she needs to do it to reassure Cassania. But she's, you know, for somebody who's not been in a war before, she, like I say, taking it in her her stride. But later on, she completely goes to pieces, and I I suspect that's probably very representative of what people do go through when they're exposed to a conflict for a prolonged period of time like well it, some... it becomes normal doesn't it after a while i mean i mm. think this is that if if you're i mean these these conflicts last for years and and there comes a point when you can't really survive unless you adapt to this is the new normal uh but i think that there are certain moments when the 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 reality the shock of it all the horror uh, really um, come to the fore and I think uh, yeah I mean there are certain I mean very, there's so many effective moments in the way that I was reminded of um, Threads probably the most terrifying English film well one of the most terrifying films I've ever seen the the nuclear uh, drama set in Sheffield. I don't know if you've oh, seen it. I haven't, se- I haven't seen it. No. Oh, well, 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 I think that, that there's a very similar device whereby in that particular film, it, it, it's, um, I think it was written by Barry Hines, who, who wrote Cass, which Ken Loach filmed. And um, it follows various people in the events and the aftermath of a nuclear war. Um, but it doesn't show you the generals in the, in the, the Pentagon. It, uh, it shows you families going about their, daily business you know their work uh pregnancy and and you know moving house and whether you know uh, a girlfriend's parents will approve of a boyfriend and things like that but it, but in in those scenes and the build-up to the, the nuclear strike it, it it's got um television reports and uh radio reports about this this kind of conflict escalating and it's background, and people don't refer to it. People don't comment about it. It's just this kind of uh, texture on the newspapers and on the soundtrack. And it's very, I think it's great in the way that the fact that people don't engage with it, it's even more disturbing, the fact that they they don't acknowledge what is too horrifying to think of. And I think there's a very similar device which is used in Mayak, whereby you do have these radio reports about the conflict and you, there, there, there is a, there a texture against which you perceive often quite idyllic imagery, mm. and and some of the time the characters will be kind of talking over it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so it, I think that that is something which I think works particularly well. And I think that the other, um, uh, before I lose my train of thought, I think that just going looping back slightly is that the I think there's a number of other interesting points in which. It seemed to me uh, that Maria was acknowledging uh, this this heritage of of not just Soviet cinema, but 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 uh, certain certain heroes. Um, I mean, to take for example, 
you have the casting of uh, Sofiko Chiarelli as the aunt, which you mentioned. I mean, and she, she is, she's a legend of not just Georgian cinema, but Armenian cinema. She's the main, she plays Syed Nova in The Color of Pomegranates. And she, she, she's the, plays the, the key role in uh, Tengiz Abeladze's The Wishing Tree. And uh, she's remarkable. And so by casting her, I always interpreted that, that, and that's in fact when I did interview Maria. That's that was the subject, and she did talk about this uh, as some sort of acknowledgement. N- not only is Sofiko or was was uh, a wonderful actor, a brilliant actor in so many different modes and forms, but it is engaging with this heritage, and uh, and I think Sofiko is a fascinating character because, of course, her father was uh, the really the the director of the most. Um, horrifying Stalinistic films like The Fall of Berlin and The, uh, the Vow, which is particularly kitsch, but, but uh, you know, with all, it's one of these films with uh, actors playing Stalin, which, of course, they make fun of in The, the Death of Stalin. But, <laughs> so, so, so you have this kind of, uh, in the form of Sofiko, you have this, it's really fascinating that her father was... Um, associated with this particular type of cinema. Her mother was this incredible legendary theatre and film actor. and you, you, She's the old lady which appears at the very end of um, Repentance by Abeladze, and who walks off the road and says, what's the point of the street if he doesn't have a church at the end of it? Uh, so that was Sofiko's mother. And and, um, and then Sofiko, of course, becomes this, this, this sort of, um, yeah, this pansexual muse of Parajanov. Uh, in the color of pomegranates, playing Sight Nova, the muse, the nun, um, Sight Nova is a young man, and you know the angel of death, and God knows what else. It's uh, and the pantomime. So, so you have this um, this connection in the form of of Sofiko. You also have this great actor, Sos- uh, Sokisian, who appeared as one of the scientists in Tarkovsky's Solaris. And 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 of course, I mean, he he, you know, he's fundamental. I think, particularly with Armenian cinema, but Tarkovsky had this Armenian overlap. Uh, I mean, he had his his, his great f- friend was Bagrat Hovhannisyan. Uh, there's a film called The Wine Press, which Tarkovsky contributed to the story and the editing. And 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 Bagrat Hovhannisyan was an assistant on Andrei Rublev and appears as a character in Solaris. So th- th- there is this connection there. And I think, but the, the other, and I would say one of the most important is uh, Otto Vazd Palishian, the, uh, the living legend of Armenian cinema, the master of montage, uh, and the way that the archival footage, which is edited into the film, uh, this is the same archival footage which Palishian uses in um, uh, the Inhabitants, which is this remarkable montage film he made for Belarus film in the early 1970s. And the film for me, which I think is in many ways, besides the mirror, is a huge influence on, on my, at least in my eyes, is, the, I would normally say the last Belarusian film, but after a, a kind of a, 30-year hiatus. He's, he's just made another film for the Cartier Foundation. But the one before was a short film he made in Armenia called The, the End from uh, 1992. And it's a train journey. It is ostensibly a documentary. I mean, that's what, what that's... It's like with all these films, it's difficult to call them documentary because they have these poetic flourishes, which you don't associate with documentary, but you do with cinema. But yeah, I mean, it is, it is about a train journey. And um, and I think that it's particularly interesting, well, the title of that film, The End, and of course, it's made in 1992, so it really is the end of the Soviet yeah. period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but I think that, that that particular film is really evoked by Maria in particularly some of the early sequences in Mayak. So you have this this sort of staking out this range of influences, whether it's Tarkovsky, and Palishian, and of course, on the one hand, embracing and discovering an Armenian heritage of the director, but nevertheless, this is somebody who studied Vigig in, in Vigig in Moscow, and it is a Russian production. 
So you have all of these influences and, and characters uh, uh, and, and and laid out as, as if to say, this is the kind of cinema I'm interested in and which we, we should champion. At the same time, the way in which she actually weaves it all together, it is uniquely her own. It's not a pastiche. I mean, I think there's no shortage of Tarkovsky pastiches, I think, for filmmakers around the world for, for generation after generation. Tarkovsky is one of those filmmakers that you imitate uh, at the ages of early 20s or, or early 30s or, or even later, you know, uh, and I think that that is really the, 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 the touchstone. But I think there are very few filmmakers which can actually engage not so much with the form of Tarkovsky, but the kind of the underlying mechanism. And I do think that that, for me, is what was so exciting about Maya because she, she gets the mechanism. She gets why he, he decided to do these formal and aesthetic choices. So I think that that really, for me, is the, the heart of the film, that she can actually stake out what she finds interesting and, and then at least strike out her own path. And, uh, and I think that's what's so... Um, unfortunate about her premature death is the way that she didn't really have the opportunity to to uh, take that to its uh, logical conclusion. But nevertheless, I think uh, with the handful of films she made, and particularly Mayak, um, I think it's, uh, it's a remarkable achievement. You know, it's the first Armenian film by, by a woman director. It's, it's, that's, that's one achievement. But I think it, it, it's much more than that. It, it really was proof how you could make a film with Armenian identity with Russian money in 2006 at the very young age. Uh, I think she, she was less than, less than 30 when she made it. Yeah, she was in her mid-20s, basically. And I think that was tremendously inspiring. And that was the impression I got when, when, I, when, I, uh, when I met her, that she was not a, 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 a woman filmmaker. She, she, was, she was not just a filmmaker. She was the... the uh, the Eye of the Hurricane, which is the uh, Armenian cinema scene. And, uh, and I, so I, I think that, uh, um, that that is particularly important. Uh, she, she, she really was the, the hub of activity and um, left an impression. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about your recollections of of meeting her i think this is the first time on the podcast that we've we've had we've had somebody who's actually met the the director of of a film that we've that we've covered because you met her a few times over the over the no, years no 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 you? just once just once just once okay yeah no i mean i i would love to say uh i i was uh i mean yeah okay facebook friends but that's i mean in my opinion that means it doesn't it's not the same it's it's uh, no i i met no. her <laughs> i met her um in uh find out the exact date but it was in february 2011 and uh i was shooting a documentary on the making of the color of pomegranates and uh the 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 budget extended to a plane ticket uh to to, to yerevan to moscow and uh, a bus uh mush- to go right to Tbilisi and back because of course that you can't do direct flights or couldn't at the time between Tbilisi and Moscow and um, and I just uh, wanted to meet people involved in the production but I at that point particular point in time Mike was just about to get released on DVD by the wonderful second run which are re-releasing our restoration of Mayak on the 27th of September that's a blog and yep. uh it's uh so so that was in the pipeline and maria was in yerevan the uh melik uh, karapetian who, who was was uh, effectively fixing the interviews for me in yerevan said wow you you just have to meet maria i mean i will just open a call her and um so yeah, we 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 met and we, we yeah we just talked and then uh, I said, well, listen, you know, I'd lo- I'd love to get you on camera to talk about your 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 take on the color of pomegranates and particularly Sofico. And if you could talk a little bit about Sofico, your impressions of her as a person, why you cast her in Mayak and everything else. And um, I can't remember the exact reasons, but we did the interview outside, and. Um, there was some 
political unrest. There was some protests. There, there was a. It was a. I mean, it, it's always a political volatile time in any country in the Caucasus, but that was a particular volatile moment in, in the early part of 2011 in Armenia. And yeah, not long after we started the interview, we just sort of got swallowed up by this crowd, and um, we had to abandon it. <laughs> So, I mean, it's it's one of those things which, um, yeah, I, w- I was digging digging out looking for the, the actual tape. Uh, but so, unfortunately, I wasn't able to use anything. But it was quite funny. And then after that, we yeah, we, we kept in touch. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, I, I remember very vividly, it was, um, th- there came a point whereby I started this process of wanting to restore this Parajan of Shorthakov of Natanian. And we met with the director of the Cinema Centre in Paris. And then she said, well, we have to meet the, the Minister of Culture together. So I took the plane from Warsaw to, to Yerevan. And then I opened up my laptop. And yeah, I just went to, to, to message on Facebook, Maria. And then I just got a message, actually. Not a message, uh, it was on the Facebook wall that she passed away. Because, you know, I, I didn't know her well, so I didn't know she was sick. Uh, so, so, yeah, it was... Um, that was, uh, yeah, just uh, m- my short meeting with Maria Saki. And, and um, yeah, that, that was, yeah, 10 years ago now. So uh, I feel very fortunate to have met her. And it, it certainly, uh, but I think that the, the real sense of Maria, I got not so much through that meeting, but the impression she made on the filmmaking community as a whole in Yerevan. So even after she passed away, I mean, you could really feel her presence. And particularly somebody like Victoria Lupic, a producer, who wasn't a producer on Mayak. She was the producer on Maria's subsequent films, and she formed a company with her to produce films. Uh, but she did have a, a production role in Mayak. And, uh, and I think it was certainly through, particularly on the Mayak restoration, that a uh, more developed picture of Maria as a person emerged. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I would highly recommend that anyone listening check out the... Uh, I guess it was like a live session that you did with Victoria and Carmen Gray for, I think it was the Berwick Film Festival. So I will make sure I link that in in the show notes as that was, yeah, that was a really fantastic and in, insightful conversation. I, I think, I think that, I mean, that, that was a nice, a, a nice balance because it was like three points of a triangle where you had, Victoria, who had produced Maria's films, and and Carmen as a critic, who's championed not just mine but also a lot of the cinema from the region, and then yeah, the um, me banging on about the importance of scanning and Brazil. <laughs> so uh, I think those the, the, that particular conversation. I mean, I haven't. I mean, you know, it, it, it felt like it made sense, and people bounced off each other relatively well, and. I haven't listened to it since, but yeah, I did. I did think that it's a great opportunity to not only to listen to Carmen's insights about why he's a critic with a focus on this particular region, Mike is interesting, but also Victoria's insight into both Maria as a person and uh, her as a filmmaker and her work process. And um, it, it would be interesting to see a, a documentary of sort, short sorts about Maria, and I, and I hope somebody makes one basically because I think it's it's, it's, it's a very small body of work of uh, uh, with very disparate films. Uh, but uh, but I think she was interesting. Uh, you know, her, her story was interesting. What I'm always saying, I mean, I know, uh, it's the amount of times when you're confronted with filmmakers where the over the the the, the drive to make films uh, exceeds anything. Uh, which can be said, and you have this very technically slick, but um, empty films. Empty vessels make the most noise. I mean, there's a cinematic equivalent of that. And um, and in the case of a lot of independent cinema, the most important thing in the world for introverted, usually young white men, is their problems dating girls. And it gets really, really boring uh watching the same um socially awkward cine literate you know films i mean they may not that may not be the plot but that's definitely the the texture the feel of it mm. and yeah. uh, and i think that what what, what really defined maria is, is somebody who who had the the uh the sensitivity the eloquence but the ability to draw on 
these dramas around her. Yes, it's a personal film. Even though she didn't write it, she's able to bring something, not something, a lot of herself to this particular story and express it through Lena, but at the same time draw upon all of this uh, conflict which would have been happening when she was very young. So the conflicts, she must have been eight or nine when the conflicts were breaking were going uh so so much younger than than Lena. And and I think that the way in she 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 integrates and 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 makes something of those those elements is really um yeah it's original as far as I'm concerned. Yeah it's worth saying there is a I guess semi autobiographical aspect to this this film in in that Maria was was from Armenia originally, and then due to the the conflict in the early nineties, she and her family moved to Moscow, and then later in life she she went back, probably at a slightly later stage than Lena in the in the film. But there there is that connection between filmmaker and, and central character. But but at the same time, I think that you know it's this thing whereby yeah, if someone announces that yeah, this is autobiographical, that that somehow attributes uh, a level of authenticity which renders it beyond criticism. And, uh, I mean, it's an aspect which which I, I find, frankly, nauseating. It, it's, it's like somebody, <laughs> someone talking about their own dreams. I mean, yes, they're, they're totally fascinating for you, but it's quite <laughs> boring for anyone else. And, and, and if you're having relationship problems... I mean, it's sort of yeah. I mean, it, it's it's the the end of the world uh, for 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 you, but it may not be the end of the world. On the contrary, it may be, you know, someone listening out of duty rather than enjoyment. Uh, maybe that says more about me and my cold, <laughs> self-centered, uh, you know, uh, lack of empathy. But but nevertheless, <laughs> I do think you could extend those things to cinema, and and I think that. A filmmaker may have experienced a particular trauma or have witnessed something or have been gone through a divorce. But that doesn't necessarily mean that what they do is of any interest whatsoever. It's great if you've got those experiences, but I think at the same time, paradoxically, you do need a uh, a distance and um you know, I mean there's that the 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 great line in um one of the later Godard films, the, the Notre Music, when they have the, yeah, he, 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 in very broad strokes, highlights the, the paradox whereby um, Homer, you know, a, a, a sort of, uh, yeah, a, a no experience of war was blind and mad, yet writes the defining text about <laughs> war, the Iliad. And conversely, you can be a soldier and not really understand what you were going through. So I do think that you know it, it's a it's a double edged sword. Um, the the amount of times you read things are basically well, so and so went through a divorce. Therefore, the film has has a level of authenticity. Uh, I'm always having this conversation with with my brother about this. That one of these these words which are just sets me on edge, and and that one of them is when people use the word problematic, and the other word is authenticity. Uh, because paradoxically, when people invoke the concept of authenticity, it is for inherently inauthentic reasons. Uh, it's, and I think that this is just because you experienced the war doesn't mean it's beyond criticism. I mean, you can you can make a completely facile film, and uh, and Mike isn't like that at all. Uh, and it it it, it is true, and uh, but but at the same time that it it the film. It does something with those experiences. It makes it impressionistic, and uh, the, the, it, it is um, uh, an abstract chatter. And then you have those incredible scenes, like the. Uh, it reminded me very much what was the the Tom Cruise film, The War of the Worlds, with the, you know, the scene when the, the, there's all those shots. It's like a refrain through the movie, like a Terence Malick film. All of those rivers, the mountain rivers. And then you hear the kids screaming, and then you see the bodies being washed down. Uh, it's such an effective, well-constructed moment of horror, the way in which she's established that rhythm of shots of the river. I mean, it is a rhythm, and it's 
all throughout the film. I mean, this is somebody who understands what Palacian is doing with his editing, distance montage. And she's applied distance montage effectively to narrative cinema, which even Palacian hasn't done. So hats off to Maria and her editor for that. So you have this refrain of rivers, and then all of a sudden, it's not done as a shock because you have the children screaming before you see the bodies. So you immediately, you're questioning who's screaming and why are they screaming when you're still looking at this river. And, and if I remember correctly, you get a, a, another shot of the children. And then finally you get to see these, these bodies being washed down the stream. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's poetic and it's horrible. And uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's real filmmaking as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that is because it's not it's not graphic in any way. No. But it is one of the upset most upsetting, it is upsetting moments moments in in the film. And and this is it's it's a it's a twelve. It's not it's not a graphic film, but it does. I mean, I haven't. I've never lived in a war zone, so I don't know. Oh, but I've lived. Oh, it, I was born in Stoke, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, right. But I grew up uh, in the Staffordshire Moorlands, as my mother's always reminding me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, but yeah, um, I've I've lost my thread. But um, sorry. No. Yeah, you're talking about not growing up in a war zone. Um, it seems to convey what that that must be like in terms of the memories you would you would have from living through something like that and. I'm sorry, I'm not not being terribly articulate here, but no, no, no. I, I think I think it's it's one of the interesting points where uh, I mean, I've you know I, I lived in Warsaw and I worked with a lot of Polish filmmakers of a particular generation, and, and that is the filmmakers who 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 experienced the war usually as children, and it's it's really you know it's just fascinating. Like Jerzy Skolomowski's father was executed, and um, Andrzej Żuławski's a large part of his family was massacred. Um, Polanski's mother was, um, yeah, uh, died and taken away into Auschwitz, and and he he obviously spent time as a child in the in the ghetto. And um, it's really fascinating how I think in each of the case, in the case of Zhuwevsky, in the, the the third part of the night, in the case of the the pianist and Polanski's case, in which they. Um, replicate certain images which they witnessed which appear quite surreal and it's probably that's the reason why they stick in their in their minds so it, it's kind of like a, a weird form of cinematic self auto psychotherapy but at the same time it's comes across as slightly surreal and weird and uh, and i think that's the sort of um the vibe, let's say, which I, I get from certain scenes in um, in my act. I think another scene which I particularly like, and I think is really effective, and, and it's not one in which anything um, particularly horrifying happens, but it does capture this uh, dread, and, and that is when she's playing uh, w- with the child, and they come across the nest, uh, and then you have the the, the helicopter. Uh, emerge oh and it's it just from from behind the ridge exactly and then you have the the relative asking him to call back and and you're not quite sure if it's gonna get gunned down or because she's running away shielding the child and then she just stops and and that's another tarkovsky reference as far as i'm concerned it's not a reference but it reminded me of a scene in the mirror and that's not just the, the angle of the shot because of course it's it's very high up looking down it's not a point of view shot of the helicopter, um, but you've got that incredible scene at the very, very beginning of Mirror when um, the uh, doctor, played by Anatoly Solonitsyn, is is uh, is walking away and he turns to look at the, the protagonist, and then it appears like the wind is is uh, blowing through the field, making this kind of texture pattern. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just this waves of grass. And I understand, and I, I, um, I, I, you know, I've, I've not double-checked this for the purpose of this commentary, but I do recall he achieved that with the help of a helicopter. That's how he did it. So, again, it's interesting to have a similar aesthetic effect, sort of the, 
the textures made on the grass of a, you know of nature by by a helicopter. But whereas I think Tarkovsky is kind of going for, you know, it, it's clearly it's clearly the presence of God, obviously. But in the in the case of Maria, it's uh, yeah, it's the conflict. So it's it's a similar image. It's a very Tarkovsky like image, but but it, it's taken and it means something very very different. It's instead of God, it's it's conflict. It's it's it's, it's a helicopter. Uh, but the image is very similar, and I think that you know that's, that's a very it's interesting. Yeah, there's one thing we haven't mentioned so far that I definitely wanted to get in bef- before we wrap things up is that there is it, it's very faint. It's a small element within within the whole, but there is a sliver of humour that surfaces from time to time. If that's indeed what slivers do do slivers surface i don't i don't think it matters but <laughs> there's there's not a there's not a lot of humor but there's it's just ever so slightly there and one thing in particular i, I thought of is when lena first visits the railway station and you've got the station master who's refusing to get out of his chair and is just being singularly unhelpful and it was just like Yep, yep. I had a very similar kind of experience now and again when I was living in Moscow. This sort of like, nope, that's more than my job's worth. Attitude. So it's just uh, uh, that that just tickled me. Um, and, and the fact that he referred to her and the subtitles didn't didn't reflect this in the um 2011 DVD that that I watched, but um. In Russian, uh, he he refers to her as Grajdanka, like literally citizeness, which has struck me as a very Soviet way of talking to somebody. But then this is you know ninety two, ninety three that this this film is set, so the Soviet Union is not in the rearview mirror very much at all. And this is a you know an elderly. I was going to call him a gentleman, but he's he's. Uh, yeah, singularly un, un, unhelpful, el, elderly, elderly, cantankerous man. But I think I think there's there's two. I mean, there's two things I would I'd respond to that. And the the first is that that whole scene it plays like a comedy sketch. It's not broad, but it all builds up to the the scene at the very end when she's endured all of this, and then for the lady to come out of the station and pin and no trains. So, yeah, like, yeah, like a hand yeah, exactly. hand scrawled note, which seems like quite a passive aggressive way of communicating something very momentous. It's just like, nope, you're getting a hand scrawled note that's just being pinned on the board. There is definitely humour there, but it, it, it's a very it, it's very light. It's not, um, uh, but I, I think it's necessary to. Uh, not only is it necessary, I think it's it's very true because how, how do you endure situations like that without? Um, not laughing at it, but 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 just acknowledging the absurdity, and it is absurd humor. Uh, you know the, the the absurdities of war. I mean, that's that's definitely, I think, uh, and and I think that all all, all, the, all of the scenes with uh, Cassiana, the the, the Sofiko's character, I think she she is funny. I mean, it's very sad that scene with the when the the, the 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 kind of when she's frightened. But I think generally she she's she's. It's one of the best mad old ladies on uh, on cinema. She's <laughs> great, and, and and that evening when they all get together drunk, I think it's, it's a fantastic scene. That, but to go back to the second point about the the the, the Soviet address uh, is that I think it's really fascinating, certainly from my perspective, in terms of looking at various countries and in, in what was the Eastern Bloc and how they all uh, have. I wouldn't say dealt because that that's past tense, but are dealing with the, the the Soviet past, the Soviet heritage, you know. And I think one extreme example you could take is is, is like uh, Czechia, um, which I still have difficulty saying. If you wanted to say the Czech Republic, but Czechia, in, in a way that very consciously getting rid of as many people as possible associated with the old regime. So yeah, the the initial difficulty was youth and inexperience. But I think that simply contrasted with Poland, for example, whereby many of the people, and to this very day, persist from that, particularly within the film industry. Uh, to take one example, like Irena uh, Stokowska, uh, who is the, the Polish representative of, uh, or was, I don't keep up with these things, of Jurimaj, 
but back in the 70s, uh, her job was basically the international promotion of Polish cinema. So basically deciding who, who gets to travel abroad for festivals and who doesn't. Who do they trust not to defect? It's, you know, and, and of course, as, as you know, from all of these accounts from of um, Soviet, I mean, yeah, you can't compare Soviet system to the, the Polish system. I mean, I, I know that there is this tendency to assume it was all the same, but it certainly wasn't the same. And uh, it was much more extreme, of course, in Russia. But it was still a communist government and there still was, you know, it was a security issue. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, you wanted to to send people to festivals abroad, but at the same time, you didn't want them to stay or run off or say bad things. So to think all of those people and uh, are actually still there, I think it does raise all sorts of questions about... On the one hand, we talk about, you know, it's like a before Christ and, uh, you know, AD as two distinct chapters. But I think in when you actually live in many of these countries, and I, I don't know about your experience, but certainly it is in mine, there is a continuity with the old regime. So to actually have someone making that anachronistic address, it's not only funny, but it's also quite true and familiar i would say and it's something i mean i I recently wrote an article about really my first impressions about about visiting almond film studio over over about 15 year period beginning in 2004 and uh, and i think one of the things i really wanted to try and i don't know whether it was successful but it, it really did have a feeling of a time capsule the the russian language the signage the smoke uh, the fact that you're sort of trapped, wedded to a cinema of the past, a cinema which had stopped. It was sort of like a a, 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 a Soviet version of Russian Ark, the Sakura film, you know, with these kind of ghosts rattling around a, a ship, you know. And uh, it, it's, I think that those, it, it really is, uh, I mean, to this very day, I mean, it's the subject of, yeah, what's what, what makes Lozanitsa cinema so rich making very contemporary films but at the same time being engaged with the past uh, at the same time you have filmmakers uh and i would say anishka holland is a good, a good example who, who, who arguably is trapped in the past whereby uh and, and vida uh, andrzej vida in poland i think was a similar problem whereby rather than actually looking at the contemporary problems let's say that the problems of let's say poland uh, the changing role of the church and capitalism, rather than address these, let's make another film about how bad it was under communism. <laughs> and uh, and and I think that that really it's it's a very different thing. Making a critical film about communism in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties is a very different thing in the seventies and eighties when communism is ongoing. It's still a going concern, yeah. And, 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 and it's a very, it's, a, it's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel later, unless you're doing something really provocative and strange and weird, like Alexei German. And uh, so, or, 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 you know, really, which is almost like a form of cinematic archaeology, let's say. And, and Kira Maratova was doing something similar, I think, with the aesthetic syndrome. I do think the ghosts of the past persist. Uh, so the idea that, yeah, it, it all ended, everything ended, that, that history ended, like Francis Fukuyama <laughs> famously wrote uh, about uh, at, at that particular time, that, that history, that the, the ideological conflict ended, and then there were all kind of, uh, as Mark Fisher put it, uh, capitalist realists, we all are, enthusiastic or reluctant subscribers to market forces that wasn't the case it still isn't the case and 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 i, and I think that um uh that's reflected in the cinema i mean yeah i i, I was complaining about these these tarkovsky wannabes but the, the idea of what making a tarkovsky film making andre rublev in 1966 and then perplexing audiences much in the same way that Antonioni confused audiences with La Ventura. So presenting La Ventura and people saying, well, what did they find the girl? What happened to her? Or in the case of Andrei Rublev, you know, why isn't he, why is he just like a bystander? Why is the film called Andrei Rublev? Because he's just like a periphery character against these kind of, you know, six or seven chapters, which don't necessarily concern him. 
it was a shock back then. You know, it, it changed the language, uh, it changed the form of cinema, and, and you know, and it alienated an awful lot of people just in the way that a lot, all the letters which are printed in the um, in the back of the Tarkovsky diaries, which Faber published, uh, all those people who were totally perplexed by Mirror, which 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 are really fascinating. It's easy with the benefit of hindsight when when Mirror. Andrei Rublev and La Ventura are all in the canon. Making a film which plays the same games without a character disappearing and, you know, unresolved endings, it's not the same now. You know, it, 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 everyone accepts and understands it. And, uh, and I think that, that, that is the fundamental difference between doing something now and doing something then. And, and again, I, I'm just going back to, to what I've said about three or four times about Mike is the way that, it's not a pastiche. It 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 it, it is. Um, she's clearly engaging with with Tark- Tarkovsky and Palacian, but at the same time, she's taking it somewhere else. It's personal, but it's also going somewhere else. Yeah, not mim- mimicry. And 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 I think her subsequent films, which couldn't be more different from Maya in many ways, really prove it to be a radical in the true sense of the word. Whereby she 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 picks up and drops subject matter and form uh you could say that that is proof of an a a, a a filmmaker who has yet to truly find their voice alternatively you could say well she's like kira maratova in the way that what defines her is the fact that you know she's so eclectic it's the eclecticism and uh and i think that that's definitely um could could you, could you reduce maratova's filmography into to to one single sentence uh, I couldn't. I, or, or it, it would just. I, I could reduce it to two words. Two words: brilliant and difficult. But but that's it. Uh, and, and I think that that's. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed going back to Mike, and it, it's it's not a film which. I think when you know the mechanism and the tricks of a filmmaker, you know when you, when you can see the strings behind the film which are being pulled to to evoke this or that emotion. It, it gets tiresome and, and a film loses its power and, and, and you either think less of it or, or dread watching it again. Uh, but but I, I, I would say the opposite in the case of Mayak. The recently, I would say, um, watching it in what, 2018 and 2019, it was under great stress just to get the damn thing ready for Rotterdam. So I wasn't really appreciating it. I was just... <laughs> Looking, looking for spots and scratches and things, and say, do we have time to get rid of those? No, we don't. But, 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 which I must must point out that in the in the the two years since the screening is that it has been fully restored, and so it'll be the first instance that the final version of Mayak, fully restored, will be available on uh, on Blu-ray by second run. So it's it's uh, restorations an ongoing process, and we we had time to at least this time to consult with Maxim. The cinematographer to regrade it. So um, yeah, I mean, watching it for this podcast, it really um, it's it's one of those films. Yeah, it's like it's like the planet in Solaris, which is you know ever changing and even more mysterious. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, I've seen I've seen it twice, but you've obviously seen it multiple times. Was there things that became more noticeable? to you with those repeated watches? I would say, I mean, certainly the last watch, I think it was the um, the Tarkovskiness of it, which I've obviously already talked about. But what really struck me is, yeah, it goes beyond simple pastiche. It's, it's really interesting territory. And I think it's also a challenge to write about. Uh, and I think this is what's interesting with film criticism, whereby um, it's easy to write about plot. It's easy to to discuss what happens. I think it's more of a challenge to to describe how something happens, how something's framed, how something's lit, uh, how something's you know what the angle and costume and and the texture, and, and I think it's even more difficult to write precisely about the emotions, the emotions which you experience yourself as a spectator, uh, and, and and trying to 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 square that with the, the cinematic technique to try and get to a third position, which is not objective, but you know, it, it's rather than just talking about you felt sad watching the film, trying to, to reconcile 
you know, the, the, the formal qualities and what the filmmakers appears to be trying to do, their intention and, and the devices they've employed. Um, I, th- I think there's a, there's a very challenging to, um, to, to write about. And I think that's why it's easy um, just, just to belittle what I've done for the last hour. Um, it's easy to compare to other filmmakers as a reference, which, which is useful because you can compare and contrast the differences as well as the similarities. But at the same time, I think it's a, it's, it's a real challenge to write effectively about uh, truly cinematic films. And my, in my opinion, is, is a truly cinematic film. Wonderful. Well, I think that's probably a good point to, to leave this discussion. So thank you very much, Daniel, for sharing your insight on this, on this film with us. Really, really appreciate that. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me onto the podcast. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege to be in such, such company and to be part of such a fantastic project. Oh, thank you. So before we go then, is there anything you'd like to direct listeners to towards uh, that you're involved with? Well, we've just transferred the Porojanov restorations, the three short films, the one he made in Armenia, Georgia and Ukraine to 35 millimeter for um, archiving projection. And, and they're going into the, the, permanent collection of the Pompidou Centre in Paris. So um, that's, it's really quite exciting to think that um, we've gone from some very ratty prints, uh, you know, about three years ago to getting them restored and playing at festivals. And uh, and now actually uh, where, where I, I think they rightfully belong, and not, not just a film archive, but an institution associated with, with modern art. And I, and I think, I think Porajanov will be, um, at home amongst uh, Abramovich installations and things like this, maybe more so than filmmakers. So I, I think that that's uh, it's very exciting. And hopefully there'll be some more screenings associated with that uh, at some point. And, and most importantly, I think for me, and is the uh, release of my act fully restored in the proper shape and ratio with, with, with notes from Maxim on second run DVD, which is released on September the 27th. Not DVD, I keep saying DVD, Blu-ray. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it also has a uh, video essay by Manuela Lazic and Alessandro uh, Lucetti, which uh, we commissioned and which is available on Mobi and YouTube and which played, I think it premiered, yeah, it did, it premiered at Barry Cotts Festival with uh, Mayak last year. So I, th- I think that that's, it's great that it's on full resolution on the Blu-ray, but you know, if you want to go online, uh, I think, I think that's a very succinct way of exploring their particular take on the film. Uh, and I think it, it's something which I think is relatively recent, but very exciting the, the, the video essay. And just to go back to what I was saying about how difficult it is to write about certain aspects of film I think that's one of the great things you can do with a video essay by just showing them and commenting. Here. <laughs> and, and that exactly and, and I think Look. that's something that this 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 six minute, I think it's about six or seven minutes, but I think it, it, it captures that very, very well. So yeah, that, that should be a great package. And of course it's got Maria's uh, student film Farewell, which she made in for gig, and um booklet notes by So Mayer, who uh, is been a champion of Maria from the outset and Vigan Galstian, who's the, the head of film heritage at the National Cinema Centre of Armenia and who knew Maria personally and I think is one of the most, if not the most astute uh, film critics and historians, more to, the, to be more accurately, in Armenia at the moment. So I think, I think it's a really fantastic package. And, uh, and I think it's great that it's coming out on second, well, it's, it's second run of put out the D- DVD, but it, it, this is a label which has really championed the film from the very beginning. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Wonderful. All right. So thanks again for, for joining us, Daniel. And that's all from us. Das Vidania, folks. Das Vidania. So that's it for this episode, but before I go, I'd like to thank Sasha Ilukovic and the Highly Skilled Migrants for the use of their song Cold in our intro. 
You can find that song and the rest of their back catalogue on Bandcamp and Spotify. If you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting us by leaving a rating at Apple Podcasts or at podchaser.com. That second one, Podchaser, even lets you rate individual episodes. So if this episode particularly stood out to you, you can let other listeners know that you enjoyed it. Recommending the show on social media is hugely helpful as well. If you can spare a moment or two to do that, it would really make my day. Thank you, thank you very much. Speaking of social media, please find us and say hi on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. You can also drop us a line at roosfilesunite at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, take care of yourselves, and bye for now.